How much does your upbringing matter? Is it just your genetics that count? And how can we even separate nature and nurture? Most people are brought up by their parents, who share their genes with their children as well as their environment. This makes proven cause and effect difficult. For example, you might have done well at school, but it's impossible to tease out how much of that success is because you're intrinsically clever, and how much is due to your upbringing. Top academic achievers often come from wealthy families, who have access to great schools and supportive parents. But without a control subject, we cannot say for sure how much of this achievement is due to inheriting great genes from clever parents, and how much is due to the advantageous environment that their children are brought up in. The difficulty of separating the effects of nature and nurture are why twin studies are so interesting. There are two types of twins. Identical twins, who are effectively clones of one another and share 100% of their genes. These are also known as monozygotic twins, and are a result of a single fertilised egg which splits into two. The other type are fraternal twins. This occurs where two eggs are separately fertilised during the same pregnancy. These twins share 50% of their genes, just like regular siblings, but are born together. Identical twins were recognised as the perfect control subjects to disentangle nature and nurture. The researcher Thomas Bouchard was the first to find and study twins who were separated in infancy. That is to say, the twins were adopted into different families. By doing so, Bouchard was able to study twins who share nature, their genetics, but not nurture, their environment. He posed a simple question. Were identical twins who were separated at infancy and raised apart less similar than twins who were raised together? Bouchard found over 130 pairs of identical and fraternal twins from around the world. These twins were given medical and psychological evaluations over the course of their life. It was found that twins who were raised apart in separate families were just as similar as twins who were raised in the same family, meaning that these twins, despite being raised in separate households and having never met, were just as similar to one another as a set of twins who were brought up together their whole lives. The best known example from this study were the Jim Twins. The Jim Twins were adopted at birth into separate families. They were raised 40 miles apart in Ohio, and although they had both learned they had a sibling out there somewhere, they were never reunited until they were 39 years old. The similarities were uncanny. Both of the twins had married a woman called Linda, then divorced and remarried a woman called Betty. They both had the same hobbies, carpentry and drawing. They both enjoyed maths at school and disliked spelling. They both drove blue Chevrolets and smoked the same cigarettes, and they both named their first son James. It's fascinating stuff, but it's just an anecdote. The data gathered by the researchers is even more interesting. To assess the cognitive ability of the twins, they were given a battery of verbal and non-verbal tests used to measure something called G-factor. G-factor are what IQ tests aim to measure. G is a measure of the following five factors. Working memory, the ability to use short-term memory to store information and perform simple tasks with it. Visual spatial processing, this is a person's ability to interpret and manipulate visual information, such as putting together puzzles and copying complex shapes. Fluid reasoning, the ability to think flexibly and solve problems. Knowledge, a person's general understanding of a wide range of topics, formerly known as crystallised intelligence. And quantitative reasoning. This is a measure of an individual's capacity to solve problems that involve numbers. G is an imperfect measure, but it is the single best predictor of academic success available. The results from the testing showed that the genetic component of general intelligence was around 70%. This finding was huge, but we're still left with 30% of the variance in intelligence unexplained. It feels right to assume that the remainder must be due to the environment, but it's not quite so simple. We will come back to this later. Intelligence wasn't the only trait measured in this study. In fact, there were many more measurements taken, all of which showed a genetic component, including height, weight, heart rate, religiosity and blood pressure. The results of this study were groundbreaking, but much more research was needed. But the thing is, it's not often that twins are separated at birth. It makes for a great story when they're reunited, but it's limited by the supply of twins who were adopted into separate families. As you can imagine, this isn't a common occurrence. However, researchers were determined. Twins were useful, but to separate nature and nurture, all you really need is adoption. 
This creates three groups. The genetic parents, nature, the adoptive parents, nurture, and the adoptee. The adoptees can then be evaluated and compared to their birth parents. This allows us to answer the same question that Bouchard wanted to answer. Are siblings raised apart less similar than siblings who are raised together? Before we go on, it is important to note the limitations of these studies. None of these subjects were in extreme situations. None were in extreme poverty or malnourished or abused. All these factors could potentially affect social, physical and psychological development and result in a different outcome. Think of it this way. Someone could be genetically predisposed to be very tall, but if they're brought up in an environment where they're malnourished throughout their childhood, they may actually be quite small as adults. Similarly, children brought up in extreme poverty may never reach their genetic potential in terms of intelligence or physical traits. This adoption study has been the work of renowned behavioural geneticist Robert Plowman, ranked as one of the most eminent psychologists of all time by the Review of General Psychology. Plowman's magnum opus was the Colorado Adoption Project. The study was initiated in 1975 and has studied children brought up by their birth parents and children brought up by adoptive parents. The study took data from the adoptees, the birth parents and the adoptive parents over multiple decades. The study is still ongoing, but the findings of the study are regularly published in academic journals. Adoption allows us to study children who share nurture, their environment, but not nature, their genetics, with their new families. In fact, one in three adoptive families adopt two children. These siblings share their home environment, but do not share any genetic material. This added another interesting component to the CAP, as it allowed researchers another avenue to determine the effect of the environment. All the participants were subjected to medical and physical evaluations, as well as psychological and cognitive testing. Every parameter measured by the researchers showed significant genetic influence. Families in the control group, i.e. the families who brought up their own biological children, had very close correlations in general cognitive ability with their biological children. This was to be expected, as they shared both nature and nurture. Quite shockingly though, the adopted children were found to be just as similar to their birth parents in their cognitive abilities as children brought up by their biological parents. These findings were groundbreaking, but the real killer was comparing the adopted children with their adoptive parents. The adoptive parents have raised the child from the very first months of their life and helped them with their schoolwork, sculpted their environment and raised them their whole life. Despite this, it was found that the correlation between the IQ of the adopted parents and the adopted children was zero. Despite all their shared environmental factors, there was no effect on the cognitive ability of the adopted children, who were just as similar to their biological parents as the children who were never separated from them. Similar outcomes were found for a variety of traits, with genetics explaining 80% of the variance in height, 70% of the variance in weight, and 70% of the variance in autism. Even personality traits were shown to have a significant genetic component, although to a lesser extent. General personality differences were 40% explained by genes. Traits like introversion and extroversion were found to be almost 60% due to genetics. Still, looking at these numbers, there is still a huge amount of variance in personality, weight and intelligence that isn't explained by genetics. If personality is only 40% genetically determined, then does that mean that the variation in our personality is predominantly due to an environment? Furthermore, even if traits such as weight and intelligence are 70% genetic, 30% of it isn't. So what is the remainder due to? Is this where nurture and environment makes a difference? There are two factors at play here. First is a phenomenon known as growing into your genes. As we age, our genes tend to explain more and more of the heritability of traits. For example, we have stated that cognitive ability is about 70% genetic, but this varies with age. As a young child, genes only explain 50% of the heritability of intelligence. But as we get older, this increases to as much as 85%. The same phenomenon occurs for all other traits too, becoming more genetically influenced as we age. The second factor is the nature of nurture. The nature of nurture was first noticed by geneticists who found genetic links to what psychologists called the environment. Why is it that you can have two siblings in a family and one of them is an outgoing extrovert and the other is a withdrawn introvert? 
After all, they've been brought up in largely the same environment. Of course, siblings are only 50% similar genetically. Twin and adoption studies were designed to tease apart nature and nurture to explain family resemblance. But these studies also provided a revolutionary new view of how the environment works. Individuals modify the environment to suit their genetic predispositions. Put it this way, parents are less likely to read their child if their child doesn't like being read to. You may go to the same school as a sibling, but you select your own social group according to the type of people you like to spend time with. There are a wide range of parenting books and strategies in the market, but the data is clear. Within the normal range of parenting, that is, outside of abuse and neglect, parenting does not make a difference. Conscientious parents will tend to have conscientious children. But this is not a result of parenting methods. We know this because adopted children are just as similar to their parents as children who were not adopted. Conscientious parents tend to have conscientious children because they are similar genetically. The fact is that parenting is more often a response to rather than a cause of the children's propensities. Children who want to learn an instrument or participate in sports will hassle their parents and create an environment that meshes with their proclivities. Children who don't want to do these things will badger their parents to let them stop practicing. Environment may be important, but it is also shaped by the individual. There were, however, two traits that buck the trend and do show a significant environmental effect. These are religiosity and political beliefs. 20% of the variance for these factors are due to the environment, which is a significant finding. Extreme environments, however, do matter. If you look at the average height of Northern Europeans over the last 200 years, it has increased by roughly 15 centimetres. This isn't due to a sudden change in the gene pool, but as a result of improved nutrition. The change in height isn't genetic, but the difference in height between Northern Europeans is. Similarly, if you take an adult who has been locked away their whole life and never learned to read or write and throw them into the world without an education, they may never reach their genetic potential. To finish off, I would like to discuss one of the most surprising findings I've not been able to shoehorn into this essay. First is divorce. Divorce has a huge genetic factor. 40% of divorce variants is genetic. It is a well-known fact that children of divorced parents are significantly more likely to get divorced. For a long time, this was thought to be due to the children not having a stable relationship when they grew up, or because of the emotional damage done to them. But adopted children were also just as likely to get divorced, if their birth parents were divorced, as children brought up by divorcing parents. This showed that the effect was largely genetic. But that doesn't mean there is a divorce gene but rather, there are a number of traits that make one more likely to get divorced. Surprisingly, the traits that made people more likely to divorce were how joyful, emotional, impulsive, and engaged with life they were. Let us know what you think. Is the nature-nurture debate over? Please give us a like and subscribe. Thanks for listening.